this week on the Back Table Podcast. Having small needle approaches, people, you know, say, well, you know, we need to have a smaller needle approach because uh, it's less painful afterwards. Okay. In general, that's a pretty good rule. I don't dispute that. But this is bone augmentation. Show me in bone augmentation where that applies. There's no evidence for that. Show me in bone op- augmentation where that does not apply. Okay. The Seiko's trial. You have a 11-gauge needle with bone kyphoplasty compared with four, six, and eight-gauge devices for the spine jack. And in the Seiko's trial, in the short term, one month and six months, you had statistically significantly increased the amount of pain relief, same thing as saying decreased pain, significantly decreased pain in patients that had the larger gauge needle than those that had the smaller gauge approach. So there's more to bone pain, there's more to fracture pain, there's more than just the what you use to do the invasion. It maybe has something to do with the adequacy of treatment. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Back Table Podcast, your home for all things interventional and otherwise minimally invasive. You can find all previous episodes of our podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and all other major podcast platforms. First, a brief message from our sponsor. Stryker's interventional spine business offers the control you need, the flexibility you want, and the quality your patients deserve. Stryker is your partner in making healthcare better. From technology to training, from reimbursement tools to patient education, Stryker is there to support you every step of the way. Innovation is the driving force at Stryker. Their extensive product portfolio for vertebral augmentation and radiofrequency ablation procedures ensures that you have the tools needed to provide top-notch care. But their commitment to advancement doesn't stop there. With recent additions like the Optoblate Bone Tumor Ablation System and FDA 510K clearance for the spine jack system for compression fractures that result from malignant lesions, myeloma, or osteolytic metastasis, you'll be eager to explore all the solutions Stryker has to offer. Learn more at www.strikerivs.com. Now, back to the show. Hello, everyone. This is your host, Jake Fleming. Welcome to part two of our discussion on sacroplasty with Dr. Beal. If you haven't already listened to part one from last week, do so before you check out this one. We need to really expand the number of people doing sacroplasty, and we'll see a concerted effort to do that. That's one of the reasons I developed the, uh, the sacroplasty curriculum. And big shout out to that upcoming curriculum. I think that the uh, course sponsored by Stryker will probably be up and rolling soon. So that curriculum has been completed. And so this is something I've been saying for a little while in the, the couple of years I've been going to vertebral augmentation courses is, hey, we need to have a station in the lab where we do sacroplasty. We need to do this. And, you know, there's there's clearly a recognition that there's something people want to add to the Armenian And we uh, can think about adding that on to uh, the fellows course for the Saddle Science Foundation. We just finished our SSF course and image guided spine intervention course, IGIS course there. And it was... Uh, I think very successful, a lot of interest in it, and a lot of things that, and this was developed to uh, feature things that are new and cool and otherwise awesome to add to your treatment armamentarium. And this, the IGIS course is really focused on people that are in practice, people that are, are in fact advanced in terms of image guided spine intervention treatment, and that are, that are looking for that next year, a little extra tip and trick and things. So, you know, that might not be a bad thing to, as an amalgam to put on that. It's a little bit crowded in terms of things that we can feature, but for the fellows course uh, at the Seattle Science Foundation coming this November and be watching out on social media, follow me on Twitter at Doug Beal, two L's, and uh, on LinkedIn, and we you'll see multiple notices about how to sign up for that course. So you fellows out there to be uh, present in one year pass or are all candidates to uh, go to this course, and it's a hands-on it's got a didactic and a hands-on lab, and the facilities are bar none, just top-notch. Absolutely agree with that, having just returned from that course as well, and just always an excellent experience. And for those who uh, have not been able to make it, I'd highly recommend the YouTube content, but it's uh, nothing compared to the in-person experience. And so as a preview to that, that some people will have the opportunity to get involved with in the near future. Let's just give a preview of kind of the basic technique, the fluoro technique of sacroplasty. I think that the CT technique is 
somewhat self-explanatory as long as you're talking about just doing a short app, what we call yeah. short access approach. Yeah. But what I like about Flora a little bit better is the ease of doing both a short or a long access approach, as well as Transiliac, which is yeah. <laughs> another yeah. story. But why don't you uh, just uh, walk our listeners through the, the basics of the Flora guided approach? So whenever you have a CT guided approach, typically you put a patient prone and you'll put the needle down into the sacrum at the same obliquity in an axial plane that the, the patient is wiring on the CT scanner. And as Dr. Fleming pointed out, that's usually an axial approach. Commonly in people that don't, don't have, uh, if they have a little bit more of a dorsal flip of the sacrum, it will turn out to be a hybrid approach. So it's not really short axis where you square off the superior end plate of S1 and you come in parallel to that to S1, square off the vestigial disc of S1, S2, come in parallel to that, that kind of an axial access point to the sacrum, that is an axial or short axis approach. That is what a short axis approach is. If you take the longitudinal axis of the sacrum, and uh, the short axis is, is going to be seen coming directly in parallel to the S1 end plate on the sacral outlet view, pelvic outlet view, and then on the pelvic inlet view is kind of a cross-sectional view that I.I. is tilted toward the patient's feet. You're looking at uh, the prominence of the pelvic brim anteriorly. And you can either start a long axis view just medial to the posterior portion of the joint, just one centimeter in dorsal from the pelvic brim. Or you can start it on the pelvic outlet view where this, the sacrum is nicely laid out to you. You can see the S1, S2, S3 neural foramina. You can see the greater sciatic notch and you can either do it AP or you can do it um, translateral oblique where you tilt your II along the axis of the SI joint with the starting point just above the level of the greater sciatic notch between the sacral parameter and the, and the SI joint. And then tap, tap, and you look on the lateral view and you put it up to the mid-body of the sacral ala. Remember that the body is different than the ala. The line that you see on the sacrum is the body. It's the body. It's the body. It's not the ala. The ala is shorter. It doesn't go up as high, and it comes out farther anteriorly. And so put it up into the middle of the sacral ala and squirt some at S1 and then retract proximally to S2. And most of the time, it will go from the inferior portion of S2, posterior inferior to the, the anterior superior portion of S1. Oftentimes, of course, especially if you use the pelvic inlet to, the technique to start, you'll get a portion of S3 as well. But the short axis is done by sticking a needle in S1, another needle in S2, another needle in S1, another needle in S2. So typically for four needles, you of course you can use the same needle over again if you want. So, But that's the the short axis and the long axis is two needles all the way down the longitudinal axis of the sacrum. So I'm going to give you a couple of advanced techniques. The transiliac view Dr. Fleming referred to, you can go uh, right in the middle of the S1 vertebral body or right in the middle of the S2 vertebral body, making sure not to go too far anterior. And you can go all the way to the contralateral side. Now that bone you're seeing, the shape of the sacrum you're seeing anteriorly is the sacral body. So you have to stay posterior to that. And you don't want to get too far posterior to get in the, the spinal canal. That part hardly is ever an issue. Uh, but you want to stay right in the middle of S1 and S2 because at the S1-2 vestigial disc, and at the S2-3 vestigial disc, you'll have the neural foramina. So if you go through the bony corridor, is what it's called, bony corridor of S1, bony corridor of S2, you can come out the other, scan on the other side, and you won't hurt anybody. So that's a, there's a vascular and a neural, and uh, you can go all the way to across S1 and cement from distal to proximal. You can go all the way across on S2, cement from distal to proximal, and that's... Um, Excellent. These and uh, time out just for one second. All of these approaches are covered in the comprehensive guide of vertebral augmentations and the uh, sacroplasty chapter. Primary author in that is Kieran Murphy. So shout out to uh, Kieran. Strong word. Uh, <laughs> you know, we have it on our shelf behind us. It and the final approach is the three needle approach. So think of the three needle approach with uh, the longitudinal axis of both sides of the sacrum with a third needle in the sacral body. And what you do, you start at S3 because you will be below the intrathecal space. You will be at the very distal tip and even beyond the epidural space down there at the very bottom often. And then you put the, the needle 
up into the sacral body along the longitudinal axis to the mid portion of the S1 body. So you can use two longitudinal access needles, one on each ala, and a third one in, into the body with the same exact trajectory as you have in the ala. And that's the three needle technique. And so there's, and then of course the hybrid technique is you just do it between the obliquity, the, the needle angulation that's between the um, axial and the longitudinal axis. So the short axis and the long axis, somewhere in between there and that whole arc closer to short, closer to long, that whole intermediate is going to be just a, a hybrid approach. And that's fine that that approach works uh, really well most of the time. That being said, one of the uh, most common deficiencies I see in the treatment uh, has to do with getting in the required amount of cement. And this is something that we beat the drum on a lot in terms of vertebral fractures. And it's kind of even more of a concern with sacral fractures. So uh, let's let's say that a typical sacroplasty injection might be, uh, let's say, four cc's. Is that going to get the job done? Oh, it just makes me cringe to think about how little cement goes into the sacrum. And so I've heard people's rationale in a vertebral body or a sacrum, well, I just put a little bit in it and it works and it's great. The patient's pain goes away. Okay, yeah, but does it stay away? And how much of it goes away? And is it durable? So there's there's whole, the whole, one of the purposes of a publication of the Swiss registry was you need to put more cement in the vertebral body because the only modifiable thing that you could do to get better and more durable pain relief was to put more cement in. That's the only modifiable thing. The other one's what's more painful, lumbar, thoracic, or thoracic lumbar junction fracture, or mid-thoracic. So transitional segments, thoracic lumbar junction fractures are more painful than lumbar fractures. And they're the only other statistical significance was um, who complained more of pain, men or women? The answer is men. <laughs> Why? Because they're sissies. You know, <laughs> it is, this is what the data says, not like that they were sissies, but they did, women did complain less of pain that, that did been, but the only modifiable thing that you could do to uh, increase the magnitude and duration of pain relief was to put more cement in. And so yeah, it's it's not okay. And, and you know, there's data by Malloy, uh, Neuenhus, Martinchik, lots of data that said you need at least 15 to 25 percent of the non-compressed native volume to make sure you have an adequate intrabody stride. This applies to the sacrum as well. So you need to have an intra alar strut that will transmit force, not necessarily the body, because most of the time, whenever you have an H-shaped fracture of the sacrum, the horizontal bar of the H is through the mid-body of S2. Most of the time, you do not need to fix that. You do not, and the vast majority of time, vast majority, you do not need to fix that, because fixing the ALA, but you have to have an intra-ALAR strut that transmits force, and if you don't have enough cement in there, you will not be able to accomplish that. And so, for you manufacturers, Here's a, a listening. So the Strikers, the Merit, the Medtronic, the IZI, the, uh, and anybody that makes cement, you have to have around 20 cc's of cement per batch. Anything less is not enough. So we are commonly putting our average amount of cement that we put in. And so the average amount of cement in the literature that's necessary is at least 6 cc's per fraction or in a 12 frac, the SEC is at least total. The amount of cement that people are commonly putting in there are closer to 13 cc's. So it's even more than that. Our average is, is 18 to 20 cc's. That's how much uh, we use uh, the IZI cement, Vertifix HV cement, and it, that mixes up 18 to 20 cc's per batch consistently. And we use that. How commonly do you, do you think we use all of our cement? Dr. Fleming, and out of all the cases, just all comers, so sacral or otherwise. All comers, I would say we use it all up maybe maybe a quarter of the time, probably less. And with sacroplasty, it's 100%. 100% of the time. So the bottom line is, you know, you're going to be using a lot of cement. We use our average is 9% per side, at least 9 to 10% cc's per side. So, you know, I, I really... I think traditionally the, the people have mixed up 10 or 11, maybe 12 cc's of cement and uh, the manufacturers do and call it good. That's just not enough cement. It's just not enough cement for people to accomplish the volumes that we now know based on the data that I mentioned. We now know based on the sacroplasty data that is con con has continued to creep up in the amount of 
cement that's added over time, keeping in mind that this has only been done really uh, since the early 2000s in, in any way, shape, or form, in any significant degree. The, it's creeping up because people know that you need more cement to get a good uh, magnitude and duration of relief. And so we, we need to be having a greater amount of cement. We need to have the manufacturers include more. I mean, this is polymethyl methacrylate. This stuff has been used since the 50s. I mean, it's, it's not that expensive. And, you know, it's, it's, it's a powder polymer, a liquid monomer made out of stuff like, you know, toluidine and benzoyl oil peroxide. I mean, this is, you know, this is stuff that is not expensive and we need to have more of the cement. And that's primarily one of the reasons I use the cement we use now. It's because it's got indicator beads. You can see the flow, which has added a whole new dimension to my perception of cement deposition in the bone. And it's about 350, 400 pascal seconds right out of the box. So it's, it's actually, it's, it's not really that high viscosity. It's kind of a medium, medium to high viscosity. And I like it because it, it, it interdigitates into the interstices of the bone pretty well. And if you have something like, it's a thousand pascal seconds, like, like the old confidence cement, it kind of gloops together and doesn't really go in all the directions that you want. It just is my opinion. So I'd, I'd like a medium to high viscosity, and that's what this is. We mix 18 to 20 cc's out of the box. That's uh, that's good, good stuff. And then we, you need to add, you need in your mind's eye, if your civil engineering of the sacrum doesn't include an uh, intra-alar strut and the ability to transmit force, especially if you have fractured pubic rami, then you are not done. And if you do have fractured pubic rami, which is really common, I mean, what are you going to do about that? I mean, are you going to fix those two? Well, the original description of a superior pubic ramoplasty was done previously. We, we have described that in the, back in 2007. So you, you can do that. It's an unlisted public code. It means you, you don't get paid for it, but you do that certainly uh, with informed consent of the patient and with in conjunction with a sacroplasty uh, just to try to get the pelvis to, uh, to heal. And this is typically seeing somebody with a very poor bone quality and who gets poor bone quality people that are deconditioned, who gets fractures, same type of person, and it increases your need to adequately get them back on their feet because these people don't have long to go before they go down. And just don't don't let that happen in your watch. Yeah, can't agree more with that. And uh, referring to the ramoplasty technique, you know, one of the places we've used that is uh, in a patient where she did have pubic rami fractures as well as sacral fractures. We went ahead and just uh, fixed her sacral fractures. And you can often do that because the pubic rami don't get all that much of the force of deposition, but they do get some. And so this patient ended up basically failing kind of non-surgical management, if you will, the pubic ramus fractures. Uh, and those take an even greater amount of cement. But I, I do want to uh, throw out to the technique doing both at the same time, or what you've coined, the radiology 360. <laughs> Front back approach. Front back, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, you know, I would encourage you to have a low threshold to do that. The people who have both fractures in front or in back are more debilitated, as I mentioned. These people need you more. And, and I've had occasions where people come in and we do the fractures in front and in back, and then the patient comes back two weeks, oh, I feel great. And you know, I, the person that's working with me, not necessarily Dr. Fleming, but in the past, they've said, you know, well, what happens to that patient if, if they don't see somebody that is able to do the front and the back repair? I guess the answer is they just, they don't get any better. And they don't, especially if you if you don't do either the sacroplasty or the superior ramoplasty. I mean, it's just the luck of the draw a little bit in terms of who they see, who they get referred to, but just do your best that you can try to stabilize what they need to. This really is a mechanical stabilization of the, the bones that are unstable. And if you can just keep that in mind, that this really is the civil engineering of the sacrum, pelvis, and spine. This is just to make something that's adequately resistant to force, that is durable, that will last. This is, this is our goal. This is, and in regard to a little bit of resistance of shear force, I've heard some misinformation been said on that news source called YouTube that Dr. Fleming called to my attention, injecting cement into the sacrum works consistently well or better than almost anything that's done, not that you do, or that's done in toto. So yes, 
cement doesn't have a great resistance to shear force. Yes, there's shear forces that go through the sacral, sacral ala. That does not mean, ergo, it doesn't work for sacral insufficiency fractures. Of course it works. It works consistently. I gave you the pre and post pain scores previously on you know, level three article on prospective single center trial, the Corbin reported. The large U.S. registry about ready to be larger in Chandra's meta-analysis. All of these are consistent. I mean, almost to the T, the, the worst one-year follow-up pain score was a 1.9. The rest of them were essentially 0.9s, under 1. So absolutely it works. And if you have enough cement in there, it does provide enough resistance. So it is a, it is a combination of compression and shear. It's not just solely shear. Uh, you know, Lindstrom had a good article about how these fractures happen and what type of forces are transmitting through there. But this is one of those things that if people say you shouldn't be putting cement into a sacrum because it's shear force and it won't work, I would defy you to give me one piece of evidence that shows that's true. And in return, we'll give you 15 pieces of evidence with cumulatively thousands of people showing that it is very true, that it reduces pain and improves function. So this is one of those things that kind of want to nip in the bud. I think this is misinformation. I don't like this being said because it will propagate the so-called conservative, which is really not conservative if it's more risky treatment of patients with sacral insufficiency fractures. If anything, there's overwhelming data and evidence saying that we need to up our ante about getting these patients treated adequately, both in terms of the acute phase and in terms of follow-up. Agreed. And it's important to remember, you know, the the biomechanics of the pelvis, as we've been alluding to this whole time, are complex, but there absolutely is compressive force in the sacrum, and particularly in that ala where it's weakest, and this is where it fails. Of course, the, the force needs to be transmitted some time, somehow to the acetabulum, and this is the path that it takes. And so while the forces are complex, I think the vast majority of these osteoporotic fractures should not require uh, fixation with hardware instrumentation. Some of them do, some of them don't. We kind of have borrowed from trauma, at least temporarily, that a centimeter or more should probably get screws and less than a centimeter could probably have uh, just cement. And I think that's that's an okay metric now. Moving forward, or I'd like to study that a little bit more. And, you know, some of our colleagues have done quite a bit of this. Um, Sean Tutton comes to mind. He works primarily with cancer. But, you know, these are the same kind of biomechanical stabilization principles. It's just the bone that's different and the type of patient that's different. But I I would like to collect some data moving forward to figure out when we add hardware, when we don't. There's a a trial from SI Bone that is either had to start or will start on placing screws for the treatment of sacral insufficiency fractures. You know, I think it, it would work. I mean, I think it clearly works. But Something tells me I don't want to put a screw in if just a cement injection with a 10 or 11 gauge jam sheeting needle would work uh, just as well. I think the less is more and uh, and the inverse pyramid of stomatos where you start with the least invasive thing and then you click down to the combination of the least invasive thing that's durably effective for the patient and you stop there. So, I, you know, we have certain ideas about when we need screws, when we don't, I think we'll follows those provisional ideas until the data says differently. And on that note, as you've referred to uh, with the minimally invasive approach, the sacroplasty has pretty high-tech equipment needs, including a uh, mortar and pestle to make cement. Yes. And spoon. And bowl. Bowl. And a relatively uh, large bone trocar. (laughs) But uh, 10 gauge is, is typically our preference, but anything... Uh, 11 gauge, I think works great. Some of our colleagues have talked about using 13 or 14. I think that's fine. But from the perspective of being able to get as much cement to the bone as possible, uh, we found that it's uh, really just cement and uh, a single or two needles is, is enough to get the jam. Yeah, you know, we're not putting this into the frame in a valley, right? right. And we're not, this is not a Gaussier and ganglion procedure. It's a sacrum. It's a big bone. You know, the SI joint, 17 and a half square centimeters of, of real estate. It's the largest joint we have in the body. And the sacrum is a huge bone. And typically the it is not painful to do these. You just not you start, especially with 
long axis technique. You start just right at the bottom of uh, S2 or end S3. You numb up the periosteum. And these are just, you have a lot more pain from movement injection of cement into the bone or aspiration because of pressure changes in the bone marrow. Those are painful. What we do putting these big needles in there, that's not painful. It's only mildly painful. So I think it, it, compare this to um, a bone marrow harvest and people say, oh, bone marrow harvest are incredibly painful. Well, it's not the needle that's painful. It's the pressure change in the aspiration that's painful. And yeah, I think 10 gauge. And remember that anytime you go down a needle gauge, you go down and flow and you the flow will be you know it'll be more cumbersome through a smaller needle and then you won't have the ability to inject more viscous cement and have greater cement control so boy in the sacrum especially give me that 10 gauge or 8 gauge every time don't don't get caught up with having small needle approaches people you know say well you know we need to have a smaller needle approach because uh, it's less painful afterwards okay you know, in general, that's a pretty good rule. I don't dispute that. But this is bone augmentation. Show me in bone augmentation where that applies. There's no evidence for that. Show me in bone op- augmentation where that does not apply. Okay. The Seiko's trial. You have a 11-gauge needle with bone kyphoplasty compared with four, six, and eight-gauge uh, devices for the spine jack. And in the Seiko's trial, it, it, in the short term, one month and six months, you have statistically significantly increased the amount of pain relief. Same thing as saying decreased pain, significantly decreased pain uh, in patients that had the larger gauge needle than those that had the smaller gauge approach. So there's more to bone pain. There's more to fracture pain. There's more than just the what you use to do the invasion. It maybe has something to do with adequacy of treatment. So I would say focus for this good rule of thumb is to focus on adequacy of treatment. Don't focus on being elegant and having less invasive tools to the point where you sacrifice accomplishing one of the primary goals is durable amount of mechanical support for that buyer. On the note of the equipment used, you referred to earlier that uh, some people have used a balloon. Your thoughts on the uh, necessity of that and how that affects Kind of the whole consideration, which is important, very important from, frankly, a billing perspective of sacral or tibroplasty versus sacral kyphoplasty. You know, I'd love to be able to use a mechanical creation device. We don't because of billing and reimbursement. And would we because if we didn't have the billing and reimbursement constraints? Yes, I could tell you I would, and I, I would use uh, as much of a mechanical device as it took. So, what do you? How do you fix fractures that have a little gap? How do you fix fractures that? Through the fracture through S2 and are becoming kyphotic, that have the kyphosis. Why wouldn't you put something in there to create a path of least resistance for the cement to be able to direct it, especially when you had fractures going through the anterior portion of the sacral ala and into the foramina? I mean, why why wouldn't you do something uh, with mechanical devices co- combining that uh, to provide some type of permanent structural support, the spine jack of the sacrum, for example? It's a different fracture, and I don't mean to imply we should be using spine jacks in the sacrum, which, of course, we should not. They're not made for that, made for vertebrae, but something like it. They had the ability to go along the longitudinal access of the sacrum, had the ability to restore some of the bony anatomy, had the b- ability to control the cement a little bit better, create a pathway of least resistance, a, maybe a sacral alar stent or something like it. I mean, these are these are things that we need to consider and the, the comment about industry, there's no industry that's paid for sacroplasty research, so we don't have any level one sacroplasty research. And where'd the Seiko's trial come from? Where'd the free trial come from? Where'd the cafe trial come from? So Opus One, I mean, you go on and on. So these were all industry funded, industry sponsored. And basically, and, and for those critics of, for industry sponsored trials out there, if industry sponsored trials are biased, if that's your opinion. So number one, I don't think they're biased at all because you'd, you'd have to tell me what point along the course are they biased? Are they biased in terms of the sites that are involved, the data that's collected, the type of data that's collected, the inclusion, exclusion criteria? Are they biased in, in terms of who does the CRO, the data collection? Are they biased in terms of how the data is processed? 
keeping in mind we have to have transparency in both data collection and data processing throughout the whole of our research trial. Is it are they biased into how the statistical significance is determined? You know what what literature source it gets sent to. I mean, who does the review? Um, who's the editorial manager? I mean, what to, what the review says, the response of us to the review. I mean, there are so many points along this time, and in and, and the industry sponsored trials that I have been a part of, and there have been you know dozens of these things. I have not seen one example of bias. I have not been pressured one time to do a certain thing a certain way because of some perceived bias and advantage that that would be have that that would potentially have not once. And so, for those of you that say that there's a bias toward industry, you know I categorically disagree. I see absolutely no evidence of it. And if you have evidence, I'd like for you to call that out for discussion topic so we can discuss it. And if all of these randomized control trials for the literature are industry sponsored and are biased, why are they less, they get the, the results less optimal than the vertebral augmentation registry and the sacroplasty registry that was studied, that was uh, sponsored by the SIR Foundation, a society, right? So I just, you know, I don't, uh, there's one of those things that, uh, in fact, we, we embrace literature in uh, trials that are sponsored by industry. Is this, they want to make new devices that are good and that, that do a lot of good for people and the device they make that's, that's slicker, better, produces better outcomes that people adapt and practitioners ad- adopt more will be better and these will be, they, these will be more profitable and these will create and do more good than the devices that are clunky and not nearly as, as well placed. So I think this is we need to be working on uh, a, a similar team, not the same team, but we need to be working in aggregate, and uh, we need to provide help. And there won't be uh, an industry sponsored sacred plastic trial, I don't think. And consequently, we will be left with real world data, which I think is 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 good, especially since it's society sponsored. And we'll, and then a category three trial. So I think will, hopefully that will protect and preserve this procedure for as as long as we need it. And this is something that, that you know it's I think in terms of data support is is a little bit tenuous. I think what will give it a, a lot more support and a, a lot better foundation is when we complete the 250 patient registry, publish that, and at that point in time I think we raise our glass to and give a big cheers to. Sacroplasty. Yeah. So Sacroplasty. <laughs> theme song. Anytime anytime we get to do sacroplasty. And it's it's appropriate because we love sacroplasty. We know the patients love it and they love the way they feel afterward. It's as you said, one of the very best things that we can do. And uh, but talking about moving to the next level with kinds of mechanical augmentation or even just routine uh, balloon augmentation. So this is kind of a odd sort of idiosyncratic situation in the American health system that we see, which uh, essentially mirrors uh, CMS, is that there's, as you said earlier, a T code for a uh, sac- uh, sacroplasty, which is sacral kyphoplasty, right. versus the uh, sacral vertebroplasty. And so what what's your advice to our colleagues as they're navigating this and a lot of them will be doing the first one in their hospital. And so their coder may have never seen this before. And certainly we have seen issues with this as well. And in order to make this a viable treatment, it has to be something that, that is paid for. Well, for vertebral plasty, it's either uh, cervical thoracic or lumbosacral. For kyphoplasty, it's either thoracic or lumbar. And so for the sacrum, a sacral kyphoplasty or vertebral augmentation with mechanical device is in most places a T-code. So my advice to people out there doing sacroplasty is out of one of the seven max Medicare administrative contracting uh, regions throughout the United States, know what gets paid and what doesn't. If your T-code for vertebral augmentation with mechanical device doesn't get paid for, don't use it. Use a sacral, lumbosacral vertebroplasty code. And if it does get paid the T code, use it because the uh, the T code stands for temporary. And this is done 
until there's enough data collected that the temporary code is allowed, or done away with. And as I mentioned, we've included both kyphoplasty and uh, vertebroplasty of the sacrum in the registry. So hopefully this will provide a little supporting data. If necessary, we can even cull it out to see the comparative results in the end. You know, we have not done that yet. And I, we won't do that until we're finished with the entire registry. But my guess is that it probably will be exactly the same. You know, if anything else, I mean, maybe providing some of the pathway of least resistance and some of the mechanical um, devices to be able to reduce the fracture. And the sacrum breaks from top to bottom at the S2, and it breaks from side to side, and it kyphosis at really at the body of S2. So, I mean, there are mechanical changes that happen. There are, are deformities that can happen with this. And uh, I think it, it probably would be about the same. I'd like to have some data for both. But just know in your area, and, you know, I, I, I use Medicare as an example. You know, of course, commercial insurance, some of them will pay for this. Most of them will actually pay for this. But most of these people, as I mentioned, will tend to be older. They'll be, you know, 10 years older than a typical person with a vertebral compression fracture. So, I mean, literally, you know, upper 90s percent for us and our practice of these will be will be Medicare patients. And it definitely underlies the importance of taking swift care of these patients who are really uh, often very fragile, uh, being older than our average uh, vertebral compression fracture patients even. And um, we've seen that this is something that helps them get up and about, which is really the whole goal. You know, the the most satisfying cases of these are a uh, very active uh, patient coming to you who's been totally debilitating and uh, debilitated and them being able to walk out, us not even have to uh, wheel them out in the wheelchair to the front, but we can just walk next to them. And it's one of the one of the be very best things we do. And uh, to our colleagues, who I know many are uh, really interested in learning more about this and getting to the courses, keep your eyes and ears peeled because I think we'll have some announcements of new courses. As we said earlier, a striker a teaching course and our future Seattle Science Foundation courses. Um, uh, these are really great organizations that we're happy to work with uh, as we try to get. Uh, people were educated about how to just deploy this technique in their practice. And once you've done it, you'll say, why Why haven't I been doing this? Absolutely. A quick shout out to Emily Bonstein from Stryker who requested the uh, curriculum. Wayne Owen, who supported that, um, as he knows as well as I do, that this is something that is very much needed. So hopefully we can start the sacroplasty courses I uh, incorporated that provisionally into the last course we did, but that was a little bit impromptu, and I did so because people asked for it, so it was irresistible to do. So uh, thank you guys, and hopefully we will see more of the sacred plastic courses uh, open up in the future. I'd sure like to propagate that as much as we can. Agreed 100%. Dr. Bill, that's all I have. Any closing thoughts for our listeners? Well, thank you for thinking of the sacred plastic topic. It isn't really sacroplasty. It's really osteoporotic insufficiency fractures, 2 million of those per year. And out of that, the under-recognition and under-treatment of this is still absolutely unacceptable. And as bad as we emphasize it, as much as I grouse about this often, uh, you, you look back 20 years, at least over the course of our treatment, you know, finally, people are the most requested course is for sacroplasty, and having just recognized and started treating those in the last 20 years, I think that's uh, relatively quickly. And for that, I'm, you know, I and I'm encouraged by the number of people that are starting to treat the underlying disorder, and this is a scourge. It's only going to increase with the age of the population, and whether it's Asia, Europe, or the United States, uh, the silver tsunami is coming, and we have to do something, you know, just like I told you a dozen times, if you don't like doing, taking care of old people procedurally, medically, and otherwise, you better start liking it because that's going to be the lion's share of people we take care of. And as you know, a lot of our practice is dedicated to uh, degenerative, is dedicated to problems that happen in the elderly. And having said that, one of the most, uh, probably the most rewarding patient population to take care of is exactly those patients. So I think the future is, is very bright. And it's our job to try to make it brighter. Thank you so much for listening. 
If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Dong, Michael Barraza, and Ali Behetti. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon, with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Josh Spencer. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz. Social media and PR by Anne Dang, Manisha Naganathanahali, and Lanbir Singh Sundu. Administrative support provided by Jim Lily Kennebrew. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening. 